In this video, we're going to explore how to create a choropleth. Remember that this is a visualization of usually geographic information that's color coded to indicate some variable. Uh, we're going to focus on doing this for the United States. And as you will not be surprised to learn, this will involve COVID data. So uh, the first thing we need to bring into the notebook is our standard libraries of NumPy and pandas. I don't know that we use NumPy directly in this. Yes, we do. We'll use it later on in this visualization. Um, the data that we're going to use is, this, is the data from Johns Hopkins, which has kind of become the standard go-to data set for this, these kinds of analyses. Uh, the, the location for the data is actually a GitHub repository, which I think is kind of neat. And uh, they basically update this time series data every day. So you can see here in the name of the file, uh, they're, they call it uh, COVID daily reports. And then there's a CSV file that's stored by date. And in order to make it easy to update that date, rather than fishing around in this sort of long, painful URL, I've just broken out that date as a separate Python variable and assigned it the value of uh, yesterday's date as of this recording. Normally the data there is updated about a day behind. Uh, so in order to uh, patch that into the to the date string here. Uh, I've made this first argument an F string or a formatted string, and that just tells Python, hey, look for these things that are enclosed in curly braces and replace whatever expression is inside the curly brace with its value. And in this case, the value is just a simple string. So this is just a simple way to concatenate that date in where it belongs in the URL. <coughs> It's also interesting to note that the, so this is a pandas read CSV method, which we've been using before, but we've been using it to fetch values out of files on our local file system. It turns out that the read CSV also will support direct access to a URL on the internet. So I've actually included the complete URL to the particular CSV indicated by the date right in this function call. And it goes out across the network, fetches that data down and returns it in from this call just as if we had uh, stored it on a local file. So that's kind of a time saver uh, unless you have network congestion, con congestion, network congestion or other kinds of issues. Uh, and th these data have quite a lot of information in them, um, probably about twice as many columns as we're actually making use of. So I'm going to just pick out some of the columns. So the use calls keyword argument to the read CSV method helps us do that. So I'm bringing in the admin to column. <clears throat> and you can see here in the, the uh, preview of the data that's coming back, that's actually going to be like a, a, um, a county in the United States or other administrative region in other countries. Uh, a lot of times you'll see data that's grouped into admin 0, admin 1, and admin 2. In fact, that uh, is visible in the Johns Hopkins standard dashboard that they've been publishing lately. You can choose to look at things at a kind of a state level, a country level, a county level, and so forth. And those are the different admin regions. And then the province underbar state column is the, as you, as you see here in the data in the U.S., that states in some places like uh, Zambia here, there isn't a state structure within the country. So that's just a not a number value and then the country or region, and then the data for that particular uh, administrative locale in terms of confirmed cases and deaths uh, in that location. So using this HTTPS connection is a really handy way to pull in all of these data, despite how sad they are. You can see we're getting back uh, 2,700 rows. So the data that's uh, in here is all for this particular date that we put in, but we get um, a lot more detail than just sort of date, country specific data. As you can tell, we're getting state data in the US and so forth. So we're going to want to uh, skinny this data down a little bit for the purposes of this visualization. We're just looking at stuff going on in the United States. So uh, in addition to, or well, so instead of just using the raw data, I'm going to use this standard pandas filtering mechanism. You're basically just saying, I want to filter the raw data and I want to filter it according to this data frame. I'm basically creating another array here that is going to filter the, filter the raw data by its country region column in those rows that equal US. And you can see here in the data itself that that country region of US is what we're, what we're interested in. So USA data, which we'll use quite extensively throughout the rest of this notebook, contains just 
information from the United States. And you can see here that we've removed, we've gone from 2,700 rows to 2,500 rows in this, in this, uh, in this new data frame. Note also that I'm in a lot of these cells, I'm having as the last value in the cell a Python expression that returns the, the uh, information that we've been extracting in that particular cell. You really don't have to do that uh, in, your own, in your own work. And what I'll do often, as I mentioned a comment up above here, I'll often include that just to, for kind of for debugging purposes, right? So if I evaluate that cell again, I can see what came out right away and kind of verify briefly that it's doing what I think it's doing. But then when I'm done, I'll come back in and either remove that or more commonly just comment it out because you generally tend to go back and try to debug things you debugged before. But if I evaluate this cell now, I've set the value of that USA data variable but I didn't clutter up my output with the with the contents. So I'm erring on the side of making this a little bit clearer, hopefully to you, by including those things, but you don't have to do that in your own work if you'd prefer not to. So now we've brought in the information about the US, about the various states, um, and then the, the details of the reporting for that particular date. Now we're gonna wanna use information that shows this, this data in uh, a choropleth of the United States. And we also want to be able to do per capita reporting. So one of the next things to do is to bring in information that will provide us with additional statistics and, and, um, and labels for those purposes. So the first thing I've got here is another read CSV. And now I'm going out to the US Census site, census.gov. And uh, it took a little while to find this URL, but this is basically just the estimated 2019 population. And it's shown as population changes from 2010 to 2019. There's a lot of information in this, in this um, CSV, and we're really only interested in kind of the latest population estimates. And this is a little out of date in the sense that this is a 2019 estimate, and we're in the middle of a 2020 census, so these could change a little bit. In terms of uh, our, our purposes, it's completely satisfactory. So uh, again, I'm using a, a URL to go fetch this directly from the US Census site. Uh, it takes, in, at least with my internet connection, takes you know a, a fraction of a second to load this in. So it's pretty quick. It's not a huge, huge file in terms of the ab absolute number of bytes. Um, it just has a whole bunch of columns. And again, we're going to use this use calls keyword to fish out just those columns that we're interested in. So the name of the, um, the name of the state or region, the summary level, and this is kind of a, a census specific thing where they've introduced this column sum, summary level and its values indicate kind of the level of detail. So it's kind of like those admin regions, admin zero through two. Except uh, what they mean here is that, so summary level 10, chosen arbitrarily, I'm assuming, uh, refers to the United States as a whole. So here's the entire popul or the population estimate as of you know, the end of 2019. Then summary level 20 uh, is regional data. So they group the states up into Northeast, Midwest, Southwest regions uh, and District of Columbia and so forth and give us the population totals for those um, smaller groupings of states. And then the states and, and the District of Columbia themselves receive a summary level of 40. So we're trying to eventually get to just have information about the individual states. So we're going to make use of that summary level to filter out the rows that we really want to get. Okay. And then the population estimate obviously is the actual actual number. So we're reading this in from the census and then here's the data frame that we end up with. Okay. Our next step is to do that filtering that I just described. So again, we only want to get those uh, entries in this data frame that have a summary level of 40, which corresponds to individual states. So you can see here, I'm taking the state population data frame, and then I'm creating another little Boolean selector data frame that's going to only be true where the summary level equals 40. And then from those rows, I just want to fetch out the name and the population estimate. I don't care to carry forward the summary level any further than this, because I'm only going to be referring to the states by names or by their two letters, uh, postal codes. Um, and uh, this, this operation gives back a data frame 
which is, of course, a multi-dimensional data object inside of pandas. But we want to use it just as an ordinary uh, a series because we're just going to want to look up the population for a particular state. So the uh, this set index function says instead of having a data frame that has a numeric index and then a column for name and a column for population estimate, use the name column as the index. And you can see here in the output that that's what's going on. This is what we're going to actually going to use to index into this into this series. And the squeeze function says squeeze this down, squeeze one, excuse me, squeeze data frames that have only one column down into a series object. And then we can also give the um, the the name column, a, or the, excuse me, the index a particular name so that we can refer to it as the population instead of, uh, instead of uh, name. Um, and then we see the output from there that we'll then use going forward in state populations. Okay, uh, we, you'll notice here in the in the data that comes back from the census that we don't get uh, the state abbreviations, which we're going to want to use because they're just a little bit, bit briefer and they're going to show up in a nice way in some of the Coropleth uh, hover functionality. So we're going to add that, and I found another data source. So worldpopulationreview.com has a nice uh, uh, interface to let you fetch down various data, data from, from the planet, including uh, states in the United States. So again, I'm using a URL that goes straight to a CSV file that's fetched automatically from us for us from that location. Uh, and of the columns that come back from there, I want to, the, the, there are no column names in this CSV, which normally read CSV assumes that the first column or several columns are names of the columns. Uh, so in order to tell it what the column names are, in this case, I've included the names keyword, so I'm naming these things state and code. And then I want, just like I wanted to have this guy be indexed by the state name, I'm doing the same thing here. I'm saying for the index of the resulting uh, data frame, go ahead and use column zero, which is the state column, uh, as the index. So in the state abbreviation table, then I have now uh, the list of all the states and their two little post letter postal abbreviations. Notice that in this data set there is some non-state things, right? The District of Columbia and then some of the U.S. possessions, so like Guam and Micronesia and the Marshall Islands and American Samoa and so forth. We, uh, although we might be interested in focusing on those outlying territories of the U.S. For the purposes of this visualization, we're actually going to filter those out and just focus on the 50 states. Okay, so that's that whole list of state abbreviations. So now we've kind of got now multiple sets of data. We've got the actual virus information by state. We've got the population information by state. We've got the state codes by state. But if we wanted to try to work with all those things together in our in producing our visualization, it's going to be a little clunky to have to refer to a bunch of different data frames. So if you recall back in the discussion of tidy data, we said that when you're uh, setting up tidy data, it's, it's great to have it in that format and have it be flexible. And as you can kind of see, we have created tidy data sets so far for all of those data that I just mentioned. But in order to use it conveniently in the actual visualization tools, as the Wickham article pointed out, you want to be able to combine those together into a single uh, a single data frame. So that's what we're going to do next, is, uh, is create a, a single frame with these various pieces and parts, and then actually add some additional information to that data frame. And we could really probably do this in one or two steps, but because I want to make it clear what's going on behind the scenes, I've sort of split this up into more detail than is strictly necessary, but uh, hopefully that will help you understand what's going on a little bit more clearly. So <clears throat> first of all, uh, if we go back to the, to the raw state data or the raw U.S. data uh, here, you can see that we've got Acadia, Louisiana and uh, Ada, Idaho and Adair, Iowa. Uh, what we want to so what we've got here is this is the county totals for this county in this state, and what we're trying to get to is the totals for the state. So this is if you're familiar with SQL queries, this is sort of the equivalent of an aggregation step 
that is going to bring together multiple rows of the of the of the data and combine them using some aggregation function so just like in sql where the the sql uh, clause that you would use would be the group by clause <coughs> pandas includes a similar similarly named and similarly functional method on the uh, data frame so we've got the usa data that we brought in and we want to group it by the province under bar state column right so this is just going to be the state names and so every row in the usa data data frame that has the same state in province underscore state is going to get collapsed together and what we're going to do with the resulting collapsed values is sum them together so this would be like including a sum statement in the select clause of a sql select select statement with a group by of province state if that helps you. Uh, what we get from that then is this list by state of the state name. Since we're grouping by that state name, it's what it's going to use as the default index. And then the number of confirmed cases and the number of fatalities in that particular case. And notice here that because we're using the state information, we get Guam and uh, cruise ships that have been called out separately by the people who've gathered the data. So we still have more state information, or excuse me, we have more rows than we really need to talk about the 50 states, but we'll see how that's going to get filtered out before too long. Okay, so the next thing we want to do is join in the population data. So what I've done here is in the in the cells, I'm just, I started out with this cell where I just do a group by and a sum. And then I'm going to build on to that as we go to show you the evolution of the, of the processing that's taking place here one step at a time. So what I've done here now is I've done a join with the state population data. And this was basically just the state name and the, um, and the state abbreviation. Sorry, and the state's population. So what you see in the result here, and this, the, the join again is named uh, in a way that recalls doing a join operation in a database query. So we're essentially trying to join together this grouped information that we just calculated that we got up here with the information that has the population for each state. And since the state population data up above was keyed by the state, and these data from this previous query are also keyed by the state, the index is the name of the state, we can just say join this previous processing with that state population data. And what comes out is here. So the places where the where the, the summary data for the population or the, the numbers for each state matches the state name for the state population, the pandas module will join those two things together and just create a new uh, a new column that corresponds to the population. Now you can see because the population data was only for the 50 states and the District of Columbia, that we have some cases here where we've got not a number of values in some columns. So Diamond Princess, although there you know, was important data gathered from that, is not a state, uh, or Grand Princess, or Guam. Uh, so there's a bunch of en entries in here that have this not a number designator. And again, we're interested in putting a chloropleth together that has just the US states. So we're going to filter those out eventually, the ones that have not a numbers. Okay, finally, we want to join on to the current data frame that we're creating a, uh, another column that has the state's abbreviations so we can use that in our visualization. So uh, same query as before, except now I've tagged on an another join. So based on the information that was created from this whole series of method calls, we're now going to do another operation to join on the state abbreviations. And again, because this data frame that we've been working on has as its index the state names, and the state abbreviation data frame also has an index for, with state names, it's going to just join together the matching indices. And now we have, in addition to our, uh, our population that we joined on, we have the state code. And similarly to what we just talked about, for those things that aren't actually states, like the Diamond Princess or Guam, well, Guam actually is, although it's not a state, it does have a postal abbreviation. So we do end up getting a value here for, for Guam. So now we've combined all these data together. And the final step here is going to be to filter out those things that, that don't have uh, meaningful data, at least for this visualization. So the final piece here is to tag on this drop NA 
Uh, Na is what Pi, NumPy uses to indicate not available. And effectively, that means the same thing as not a number. So any place up here where we have a not a number, the drop Na says, just throw away those rows. So in the final version of this USA states data, we get a nice clean and tidy, in this case, um, uh, version of the data that's keyed by state, shows confirmed cases, fatalities, the population of that state, and then their, uh, their state code. Now we also are gonna wanna be able to visualize per capita data. So right now I'm adding an additional couple of columns that give us that information. So uh, we can add columns to an existing data frame. So this, this data frame here is the current version of USA states, and we're gonna add a couple of new columns there. You can't uh, use the, the, the Python dot abbreviation going on here uh, when you're creating a new column. That's just a constraint of pandas. So you've got to use the more clunky uh, array-like syntax to indicate the name of the new column you want to create. And I'm basically just doing a simple calculation of the confirmed cases divided by the population. So you can see we get basically confirmed divided by population gives us the confirmed per capita. It's a pretty small number, but that's to be expected because there's a bunch of people and not in absolute terms, not that many confirm cases. Uh, and then I do the same thing for deaths per capita. So I get these two new columns that is gonna allow, are going to allow me to visualize those, uh, those statistics uh, in the, in the uh, core pleth. Okay, <clears throat> now uh, here's the core pleth that we're going to come up with. Oops, it likes this resize. So uh, I demonstrated this for you in class or on our on our last uh, synchronous call the other day, but uh, basically it allows us to choose whether we want to look at confirmed cases or deaths. You can see that the the map changes dynamically as we choose the different uh, different data that we want to show. I'm also providing a summary of the total number because these are going to give us information only by the state, and this is going to roll it up into the total for the whole country. So confirmed cases is right now 335,000. And if we look here, we can see that there's only 286 of them in Montana. We can, uh, so the, the core pleth visualization includes um, a scale. So this is the confirmed cases view again. We show, we're showing confirmed over here and it's, it goes from zero to 120,000 in, in New York, 123,000.1 uh, in that state alone. Now this is a little bit hard to visualize what's going on in the rest of the country beyond those states that, at least as of today, are most heavily affected by the virus. So one way to switch that up is to look at this on a log scale. So instead of showing the actual values of the, the number of confirmed cases, now we're looking at a log the base 10 of that value. So we're essentially sort of flattening out the we're not really flattening out the curve that everybody's talking about, but we're flattening out that that curve to show in a little bit more uh, more readable, more visualizable gradations uh, the relative values of number of confirmed cases. So we can see that New York still is the highest of of the fifty states right now, but Michigan, Illinois, Louisiana, Florida, some places, Washington and California, which are places that are much in the news right now. Um, also have significant significant cases. And it's just easier to see this with a logarithmic scale than it is to, if I take that off, um, to see it in a linear scale. Uh, the numbers are a little bit weird, right? Because now we're looking at the, the log the base 10 of the number of confirmed cases, which unless you're a math person is a little bit hard to, to understand and why they probably don't report numbers this way in the in the press. And we'll look at another way of visualizing these things that is a little bit more friendly to the to the non-mathematical person in the crowd uh, in a second. We take out that log scale. I've also set up to look at per capita data, which is the reason that we just extracted that per capita, calcul per capita calculation. Uh, so this is the per capita numbers. Again, the, the values are a little bit a little bit weird, but we can see the a little bit more um, information about states that um, have fewer cases than than the the maximum that's currently in New York State. So Louisiana kind of pops right to the fore. They've got a big issue right now in the New Orleans area, and they don't have as large a population obviously as New York State. So they are going to show up a little higher on the on the visual scale here. And we can also apply both the per capita value and the log scale, 
and we get again a little bit clearer picture about the relative uh, infection rate in different states. Okay, so given that overview of what it looks like, let's go back and look at the code that created this visualization. So we're using a, a, a package called Plotly, which is uh, a very extensive Python and JavaScript, uh, it's actually Python and JavaScript kind of together, library to allow us to create these more interactive visualizations. Um, in the previous visualizations that we've been talking about, we didn't have this kind of nice, um, well, we didn't have the choropleth, but we also didn't have this interactivity available to us. We didn't have any way of switching these things on or off. We didn't have any way to hover over existing data to be able to get more information about what's going on in that location. Um, and the Plotly library uh, integrates together um, JavaScript code using the data-driven documents or D3 library, as well as a Python libraries to make it easy to integrate these visualizations into the um, in, into the uh, Jupyter Notebook here. The other thing that we're going to make use of is these these widgets. These are coming neither from Jupyter itself or Python itself and not from Plotly either. Uh, these are something called the IPy widgets that are connected to the IPython environment. So they've been around for a while in order to allow you to create um, more interactive visualizations, and they've been integrated into uh, into Plotly and into the Jupyter Notebook and Jupyter Lab um, environments, so we can kind of create these things pretty straightforwardly. Okay, so I'm bringing in Plotly. Plotly has a, a it's a very large library. Uh, one of the ways that they reduce the complexity of the library is to sort of group together common kinds of visualizations, and there's dozens of them, uh, inside of a Plotly Express package that we'll bring in as PX. Then here's the widgets that we're using. As I mentioned, IPy widgets is another standalone library that lets us build these kinds of things. And we're going to create a checkbox, we're going to create a dropdown, we're going to use a label, and then HBox and VBox are used to do layout. Uh, and then I'm also going to, um, in addition to using uh, Plotly Express, I'm going to use Plotly's sort of lower level graph objects library. And that's going to bring in a figure widget, uh, which is going to allow us to include our plot inside of the inside of the widgets framework that allows us to interact with it uh, with those widgets. And then I'm also going to bring in a choropleth and a layout class from this graph objects library to be able to actually create the framework for the for the visualization. So um, let's just walk through this code. Uh, the First of all, I've defined a new local variable called df. Um, actually, it's a new global variable called df. And I've assigned that to just be the same value as US states. Uh, what I've found is, as I experiment with different ways of visualizing the data, that uh, it's, it, it's a little bit easier, particularly if I had multiple uh, versions of the, of the raw data that I'd brought in up above, it's a little bit easier to just sort of assign to a common global variable the value that I want to manipulate. And if I had other data sets up above, I could just redefine this one assignment and then be able to access those without changing a bunch of code throughout. Um, a, probably a better approach to doing this would be to in, in, encapsulate all this in, uh, in separate functions instead of top level variables and, um, uh, and function calls, or even make a class that you could ins instantiate multiple times. But for purposes of just kind of this simple learning process, we're, we're going to kind of keep it as simple as we can. But DF, it, which stands for data frame, uh, and is a pretty common abbreviation that you see in um, in the uh, pandas community, uh, is just going to be a reference to that same USA states data. I've got a little uh, throwaway function that just formats a total. Uh, that's what's being used to, to define this. Total confirmed equals some number. Um, the next step here is to create some of these IPy widgets. So I'm using the dropdown class, and I, you can see that I've uh, imported that from the IPy widgets library itself. Uh, and what I'm uh, doing to configure this guy is saying basically I want to have a description. This is going to turn into a label, and you can see it says show this particular thing, show confirmed or show deaths. Uh, and then the particular values that I want to be able to allow the user to choose among. So we've got just confirmed and deaths, and uh, you can add as many of these as you want, and it'll automatically add them to the list. Then I have a couple of checkboxes. Again, this checkbox class is imported from 
the IPy widgets package. I'm giving them a description just like I did up here that's going to show up as a label and then giving it an initial value of false and then similarly for the per capita checkbox. So log scale and per capita are both going to be checkbox objects and obviously they are going to show up as we've seen down here. And also need to take this uh, or create a label object that's going to be used to show the, the totals. So as I uh, as I make changes, that gets updated automatically. And then uh, that completes kind of the, the individual controls that I need to be able to create. And as uh, I've talked about previously, there's a whole bunch of other uh, classes that are defined in this IPy widgets library that basically lets you put up any kind of a standard web style control inside your visualization. Next thing is to actually create the widgets that, that's going to display the Coropleth. So um, in the, uh, in, the uh, in the Plotly library, where, when, we're, uh, when we want to embed something that has, the, when we want to embed something that's sort of at the boundary between uh, the, the widgets and the visualization, we want to wrap it up in this thing called a figure widget. So again, it's, this is a widget library. So this figure widget is basically saying, hey, I've got a plotly object, which is going to do all the heavy lifting in terms of the display, but I want to wrap that up as a widget so that I can use it to interact with the other widgets that are on my, on my cell. So this is just a constructor that uh, creates that widget. And if you go look at the Plotly documentation in more detail, you'll see that this guy, uh, that, that there are variants of this that will create the figures, but not turn them into widgets, which you could use if you weren't trying to do an interactive visualization, but still wanted to use all of the Plotly goodness. And Plotly distinguishes kind of two main features of any kind of a figure. Uh, and yeah, that's reflected here in the keyword arguments that are being passed to this figure widget. So the, the data and the layout are considered separate things. So in the in the data, we're using the Coropleth object. Again, this is something that we brought in up here from Plotly. So this is functionality that we get from Plotly to be able to create these sorts of things. Uh, we need to configure this thing basically by passing these additional keyword arguments. So First of all, uh, the f the, this, this first one, locations, uh, is going to be set to the code column of our data frame, right? Remember that we made this data frame just be an alias for USA states. And the code column, if we go back up here to look at what that data looked like, uh, is basically just the state code. Now, this is important because the... the um, the geo information, the, the shapes information that's going to be used to generate the map of the United States is keyed by the U.S. state abbreviation. And this is just a convention that Plotly uses in its Coropleths, but we've got to be able to conform to that. So in order for us to tell Plotly which, which state a particular part of the data set conforms to, we've got to tell it, here's where you go find the state codes in our data frame in order to synchronize our data with Plotly's expectations. So this just matches up the state in our data with the state in the in the map. Then we also want to be able to connect up the value that we want to display for each state. So we're going to grab a column out of the data frame and assign that to this keyword Z, which is pretty minimal Z, a keyword. Uh, the Z value basically just says, uh, what do you want to use as the value that's going to be providing a color for that particular portion of the map, that particular shape on the map? And you can kind of, I guess the reason they call it Z is because, you know, we've got, the, we've got the X and the Y, the X and the Y dimensions going on here in the map. And the Z is going to give us the, the third dimension, which is being represented as a color. So in our case, we're going to fish out something from the data frame. Well, which something do we want to show? Well, it, we want to be able to show either confirmed confirmed cases or fatalities in the Coropleth. And so we've got to be able to fish out either this column or this column, confirmed or deaths. Well, that's being determined for us by the dropdown that allows us to choose wh which of these two things we want to, we want to visualize. So, 
in, instead of just hardwiring in a particular column name here, I'm asking for the current value of the which column widget. And the which column widget is that dropdown that has either confirmed or deaths. So by using dot value on any of these widgets, we get the actual value of the currently selected thing. So that says which of the things we want to actually use to color the, the chart. Now there's some uh, location mode here is actually a specific a specific pr uh, key, keyword parameter that's used by Coropleth. Coropleth actually will allow you, without doing anything else, it just has built into it a world map and a USA states map. Uh, so what we want to do is, is tell it to just use the USA states and the location mode is a Coropleth specific figure keyword that lets us to specify that. And we also want to um, indicate what we want to show as the title of the color bar. So over here on the color bar, we've got a, a title it shows confirmed right now because we're looking at the confirmed data. But if I switch this over to the fatality data, you see that the color bar changes its title as well. That's happening because we're specifying the title bar color, sorry, the, the, the t color bar title, um, yeah. With uh, with a, again with the value of the of the which column control. So this is going to switch between confirmed and deaths based on which thing the user has selected. And then finally, we have to set the color scale for the for the visualization. So um, here's a place where we're using that that um, uh, Plotly Express library. It comes with a whole bunch of predefined sets of colors, which you can explore if you go look in the documentation for Plotly. But I've just chosen this one called Plasma. And then the underscore R actually says reverse the uh, the sequence of colors. So these these colors objects are really just an array of uh, CSS color values, and they're used to interpolate between the various values of of the uh, the Z value that's shown in the map. Okay, so that takes care of configuring the Coropleth itself. We also want to do some things with the layout. So this has to do with kind of the how the how the figure itself gets laid out in the page. Uh, a couple of things here. One is that and this is again specific to the Coropleth. We want to have the scope of the of the geo data that's being displayed constrained to just the USA. It turns out that the underlying uh, data sets that are used by the Coropleth figure um, are able to show different parts of the of the world and we just want to see the United States and I'm also setting a margin there's a there's a this is kind of like the a, uh, a CSS uh, mar margin in the box model uh, except they make it more explicit with right top left and bottom and I'm just making it all zeros to make the visualization be as large as possible okay so <clears throat> although we are using the Coropleth figure inside of inside of this uh, this constructor what we're really coming up with is a wrapper around that figure that acts like a widget. So all of these things together, the column dropdown, the checkboxes for log and per capita, and then the label of total, as well as the map itself and the color bar, which is generated as part of the Coropleth object, are now IPython widgets, or and some of which come from built-in IPython things like dropdown and checkbox, some of which are extensions to IPython that come from Plotly. So to display that, I'm going to skip down here to the end of this. To display that, we're going to use uh, these other methods that we brought, or other objects that we brought in from the, let me just go back up here. Here's uh, HBox and VBox coming in from the IPy widgets. Those are layout widgets that allow us to specify how we want to have these different widgets appear on the screen. Uh, so we can, if we kind of start from the inside out, we can see here I've got which column and total label. So that's these two widgets. This is the which column. This is the total label, and I'm including those as argument or as a, a list of, a list to the constructor of the VBox widget. So this says basically take those two widgets and wrap them up in a in another widget that is vertically oriented. So we get this VBox here that has those two things in it aligned vertically. Then uh, for the per capita and the log scale widgets, that's these two guys. I'm saying wrap those up inside of another widget that is also vertically oriented. So I get these two things showing up one on top of the other. 
the, and then in turn, I'm going to, I want to have these guys line up next to each other left and right. So I'm taking those two V boxes and wrapping them up in an H box, which takes one widget and another widget and lines them up side by side. Then I want to have the actual figure, the Corapleth, show up below that H box. So I'm taking the H box and the figure widget, the Corapleth itself, and wrapping those up in a, in a V box. So I've got this collection of widgets, which is all wrapped up in one H box, this guy. And I've got this Corapleth widget that's represented by this variable. And I'm wrapping those guys up inside of a V box so that they get oriented up and down like this. So that's how you get to lay, to lay things out. And there's a lot of options for these things in terms of spacing and justification and alignment and all that kind of stuff, which I'm not going to go into here, but you could certainly go look at the documentation for that. Now, if that's all we had, we would only basically be able to visualize the default values for or the visualization that corresponds to the default values for all of these widgets. But we want to be able to have these update themselves in real time. So in order to do that, we've got to do two things. We've got to say, when a particular widget is activated, call some function. And then we have to define that function to tell it how to update the rest of the, of the visualization. So the way that we connect up these controls with some function is using their observe methods. So which column, log scale, per capita, they all have, they're, they're all widgets, right, that I brought in from, from the, uh, the, the drop-down checkbox classes in the IPy widgets library. And because they're, they're IPy widgets, they have this observe method defined on them. And what observe does is basically connects up the widget to some function that's going to be invoked when that widget activates. So in the case of the which column dropdown, when you make a new selection there, it's going to call update figure. And it's going to pass in um, of the, the value property of that widget. And this, in, this, in this case, this is just either a string that says confirmed or deaths. And similarly for the log scale, we're going to call the same function and we're going to pass in the value, which is just going to be true or false. And that's also going to be true for the per capita checkbox. And it's not required that you always call the same function here, but because each of these widgets, when you make a change to the widget, they're going to impact the, the display of the map. In this particular case, we do want to call the same function for each of these, uh, each of these events. So what does update change look like? Um, you can see here the vestigial remains of some debugging. If you want to see exactly what those change objects look like, you can uncomment this. But basically what we're, what we're doing here is we're going to update the information in this figure widget based on the current values of all of these controls. So the first thing I'm going to do is, uh, well, I'm going to grab, I've got a local variable here called column, and I'm going to use that a couple different times, so I've broken it out into a separate variable. Um, and the color bar title, what do I want to show here for the color bar? And I'm going to assign both of those to say, to, to which column dot value. So I'm reaching, a, this is basically the same behavior that I had up here when I was choosing the particular column from the data frame by using which column dot value. Uh, this is going to be just basically be either confirmed or deaths, depending on the current selection in that which column dropdown. So these two variables are both going to be assigned to that. Let's just assume that we've chosen confirmed. Um, now I'm going to uh, check to see if I want to display per capita data or raw, raw data. So I'm going to check to see if the per capita checkbox is true. In other words, and, and using the dot value um, attribute again to check to see what its current state is. If it is true, I want to do two things. First of all, I want to update the column name to include underscore per underscore capita. And I've chosen, if I go back here to where I added the per capita data, you can see that I chose these labels very intentionally um, because I wanted to be able to choose between either confirmed and confirmed per capita or between deaths and, or deaths per capita. So I named these in such a way that it made my code convenient to write down below. Uh, so if I have, if I haven't checked the per capita checkbox, the column is just going to be either confirmed or deaths. If I have checked the box, then I'm going to append onto the end of this column name, underscore per capita, and that's going to choose the per capita columns. And similarly, I'm going to update the color bar title to reflect 
whether or not this is per capita information. And instead of using this kind of ugly variable name, I'm going to actually do something that looks a little bit more uh, human readable. So if I go back down here to check per capita, and if you keep your eye on the confirmed label, you can see that that gets updated just like the data do. Um, okay, so, so far I've just initialized these local variables. Now I need to actually go in and configure the, the widget itself. So within the figure widget, and you got to kind of go look at the documentation for what these figure widgets look like, it's got a, uh, a data object, and you can see that that's reflected here in the way that we construct the figure, right? We, we set a value for data, we set a value for layout. Uh, so we can access the data uh, object of that figure widget. It turns out that we can have multiple data sets displayed in the same uh, in the same figure. So we've got to say, let's use the zeroth data element, and we're going to set its color bars title to our color ball color bar title variable. So this is just uh, descending the hierarchy of of properties inside of this figure widget. And again, got to go look at the documentation for the figure widget to figure out what those are. Uh, that's going to update the title, and then this is going to update the, the values that we're going to use for Z, which is, again, displaying the particular color. Well, we've got to now take into consideration whether or not we've chosen uh, the log values. So uh, we're going to use the, the Python ternary operation, um, if, and we're going to look at the particular data for the column that we've selected. So again, we're using this column variable, which is going to be either confirmed or deaths, which actually corresponds to the name of the column in the data. So <clears throat> if the log scale button is true, log, or log scale value is true because it's checked, we're going to use the, the particular column data, but we're going to call numpy's log the base 10 method on it. So that's going to take the log the base 10 of all these columns and assign them to Z. But if log scale that value is false because it's not checked, we're just going to use the raw DF column information. So what the data frame and whatever column is selected is going to be used directly for those Z values. And then finally, we're going to update the label, this thing right here that says total of whatever. Uh, and because um, I wanted to simplify this little update function, that's where I broke out this little format total function that's up above here. That just basically returns a string that uses the column label and the column value. And it also, actually it's doing more than that, it's doing a little bit of calculation here in the sense that we're going to sum up the total of that, of that column. Okay, so anytime we make a change to any of these widgets, that's going to call this function and update the display. As I said before, this kind of a visualization is a little bit tricky to understand if you're going to be showing log scale data. It's not going to be something that's as simple for people to understand when there's these weird values for the, for the logs themselves. Another way of visualizing this statewide data is by using a, a categorical scale instead of a numeric one. So here's an example of that categorical scale. So I've grouped together the different numbers of, this is confirmed cases right now, shows the number of confirmed cases in these different ranges and then colors the states by discrete color values that show the details of the information uh, in, that, in that scale. So it's pretty straightforward to tell kind of where the impact of the virus is being felt more keenly and where less so. Uh, but you don't have to sort of figure out, well, what are we talking about with categorical data, or, excuse me, with logarithmic data and so forth. So let's take a look at how we can create this. I want to point out that this is not, um, although the, the pop-ups here, the hover information is coming to us courtesy of Plotly, I don't have any IPy widgets associated with this, so it's not uh, as dynamic an uh, interactive experience as for the previous Coropleth. But it does serve to illustrate how we can do these categorical categorical presentations. Um, we're still going to use the Coropleth object from Plotly, and what it does is it, uh, it determines whether to show a categorical map like this or a numerically scaled map like this based on the type of the data that's being used in the Z, the Z index, because we used here just a range of numeric values it's going to assume that we want to use this kind of numeric coropleth. 
if instead we use values that are non-numeric, it will assume that we want to present some sort of a categorical plot. So what we need to do is, first of all, kind of take that numeric data from, from earlier and bin it into smaller pieces that correspond to these different categories that we've got here on the right-hand side. So again, here in the data set, I'm creating a copy of the U.S. data and storing it in this, this um, local, or I'm overwriting that global variable so that I can use it consistently throughout here. Again, probably a better idea to encapsulate this all in a function or a class. But for our purposes, um, that doesn't seem super important. Now I kind of walk through this a little bit with you and show uh, in a little bit more detail what's happening under the hood. So first of all, uh, let's just evaluate this. Well, I've already evaluated it because we're showing this, this cell. But let's take a look at what's in bins here. You can see that uh, I've defined a bunch of values that are going to correspond to kind of the breakpoints where I want the different different uh, values to be categorized. Uh, and most of these are just, I've put in manually and just experimented with values that seem to make sense for this particular data set. Uh, one of the challenges associated with that is, sadly, the numbers are growing over time, so I've had to adapt this in a couple of different cases to, to be able to capture some of the variation. And then I've also uh, chosen to make the top value be the maximum confirmed number of confirmed cases. So this is actually coming from this data frame that has that USA data going to the confirmed column and taking its maximum value. So you can see here that the top level is 123, 160, which is currently the number of confirmed cases in New York City. So this gives us kind of the breakpoints between those, uh, between those different values. Now, I want to take this and convert it. Instead of having it be numeric values, I want it to be string values so that it will tell Plotly to treat this as categorical values instead of, instead of numeric ones. And you can see this, uh, this uh, list comprehension here. Um, if you're not familiar with these, you really should be. They're a very handy way to construct lists in Python, which happens all the time when you're doing data analysis. So instead of creating an explicit loop with a, with a for in kind of a statement, what a list comprehension allows you to do is basically just declare a list according to what you want to have show up in it. It's quite similar to the idea of, that you might use if you're declaring um, uh, the contents of a set in, in math. Here we're saying, and you can see here that the, uh, the, the value of this is going to be a list, right? We've got the array syntax here um, on the outside. And inside of the array syntax, we're defining what we want to have in this list. So first of all, we want to be iterating over this crazy zip thing with bins. Well, what in the world does that mean? Let's take a look at just this little chunk. Paste this up in here. Well, that's not helpful. It's a zip. Let's convert that into a list so we can actually see what it looks like. What it's doing here is it's taking each of the pairs of values in that bins list and hooking them together into a tuple that contains the lower and upper range of the different values at those, at those breakpoints. The zip function basically takes two lists and it zips them together. So if we had A, B, C, D in this list and E, F, G, H in this list, it would group together the A and the E and then the B and the F and so forth and create tuples out of them and return that as its, as its value. In this particular case, what we're zipping together is the bins list with itself. So the first argument here is the bins list. So that's just gonna be 100, 200, 300, 500, and so forth. But then the second argument to zip is gonna be bins, but indexed starting at the first, at the, at, the, at the second element of the list, which is an index of one. So while this is 100, 200, 300, and so forth, this is drops out the first element. It's 200, 300, 500, 750. So each of the pairs are gonna be basically an element in the list and the next element in the list. And then it's gonna to go to the second element and the third element and the third element and the fourth element. And it's gonna do that until it runs out of a list. And it's, that's gonna happen just as it encounters the last value in the list in this array. And then the next time it tries to iterate, it'll find that it's reached the end of the list and it will terminate. So we're basically just taking these consecutive values from that list, pairing them together in this, uh, in this zip. 
Okay, so so this is a list of tuples of pairs that contain the lower and upper range of the values that we want to use in our categories. So this list comprehension says evaluate this expression for x assigned to each of the values in this list in turn. So it's going to start out with x being assigned 100 comma 200 and it's going to use that in this expression. Well here's another one of these f strings, a formatted string, and it's going to take uh, the x of 0, which will be in that case 100, and x of 1, which will be 200 in that first tuple, and stick them together in a nice string that shows a range. And then it's going to continue to do that for each of the values in this zipped up list, formatting them as a string and wrapping the whole thing up as an array. So if I switch this over to show you what labels looks like, there you go. It's now an array still, right, because we did a list comprehension here, but that array now contains a bunch of strings that just happen to have as their values the different ranges of values that we're interested in splitting the data into. So because we're going to use that labels information as an array of strings as the uh, categories for the choropleth, it's going to give us this kind of a display with discrete values according to those categories instead of the type that we saw before we using the numeric values. The next step is going to be to take the values from our, our data frame and split it up along these boundaries. And there's a built-in function in pandas for doing that called cut. So what it's going to do is it's going to take and cut the cut up the data in confirmed, in the confirmed column of the data frame, right, because we're plotting confirmed data. It's going to cut that up according to the list of, uh, the, of these bins. These are basically just boundaries between which the, the data will be split by the cut function. And not only is it going to do that, but it's also going to associate with those cut values the appropriate labels from our labels list, right? So I'm using a single array containing the various breakpoints between categories. I've automatically constructed a labels list based on that so that if I change the contents of this list of bins to include a new value or I want to rejigger them because I want to focus more attention on some part of the range of the data, their labels update accordingly. And then, um, so these two things are in sync basically is what we're saying. I'm passing those in as the bins and the labels to this cut function so that at the end of the process, what you see in that DF quantity, DF QTY, what you get is the state and then its appropriate label. So uh, Alabama itself, I don't know what actual the actual value in Alabama was, Let's go back up and look at the raw data. Here's Alabama. It had 1765 confirmed cases. And that's the value that's going to be used by this cut function to categorize it into the range where 1700 fits. Right? So the cut function is just splitting the data up into those different ranges and assigning a new column that we can then use as the column that we're going to hand off to the choropleth so that it uh, displays the categories. Okay, so let's, I don't need that anymore. Let's get rid of that. All right, so now we have the information we need to display the, the, uh, the map. Before, we were using the graph objects library within Plotly, and in this case, we're going to show how to use the PX library. This was the Plotly Express library, and it's got a choropleth function defined within it. And this is kind of the, because it's the Express version, it's kind of a simpler way of configuring a choropleth, except that it doesn't make it super easy to use widgets to control the contents of the choropleth. So if you're going to use widgets, probably easier to use the graph objects thing, which is what I did up here. Right, we brought in these things from graph objects, the figure widget, the choropleth itself, and so forth. But we also had imported Plotly Express just as PX, and it defines a bunch of functions that are shortcuts that help you create these different kinds of maps without having to configure each of the individual objects. So the choropleth function takes as its first argument the data frame. You recall up above, we were having to refer into the data frame with particular, we'd have to say like df.code or df. Um, uh, bracket quote code quote bracket 
here we can just say we only want to look at one Cora or at one data frame. The, the full-blown Corapleth object allows us to look at multiple data from different data frames if we want. But in this case, because it's the express version, it's just going to allow us to do one. Inside of here, we still need to be able to, to tell the uh, Corapleth object what we want to be able to actually plot. So instead of having to say, uh, instead of having to say df of code, we can just say locations equals code. That's not just the label of the column that we want to have displayed, and it's going to go look in this data frame to find a column with that name and use that as the as the location information, basically pairing the state abbreviations to the state information in the Corapless um, shape map. We're also going to supply this location mode to display only USA states with a scope of USA. So those are very similar to the previous uh, example, except they show up here in the Corapleth method call itself. We're now in, th and this is where we get the switch over from a numeric to a categorical plot. We're telling it to use as a color that quantity array. Again, the Corapleth object distinguishes between an array of numeric values, in which case it uses this kind of a presentation, and an array of string values, which it assumes to be categories and presents this kind of a visualization. So that's because we're passing in quantity, which is the name of the column that we constructed up here to have these labeled versions of those state of those state um, confirmed cases. That's why we end up with a categorical Corapleth. Uh, we need to tell it which um, which color scheme to use. Again, there's a bunch of color schemes that are defined by the Plotly Express library, and we're telling it specifically to use or to, to configure the color discrete sequence. There's also a color continu continuous sequence uh, property that you can configure if you want to do a map like the one above. We're going to say that ordering of the qu categories has to be a, a specific ordering. If I if I take this out of here, just comment it out and reevaluate. What you'll see is that the order of the of the output here is no longer sorted in any kind of a reasonable order, right? It's just the um, the order that appear in some hash table someplace. I'm assuming. So category orders organize the quantity variable according to the ordering in the labels array. So I'm just, again, I wanted to set up this, these bins and labels to be calculated for us uh, so that we didn't get them out of sync, but it turns out that because the labels are already in the order that I want them, I can just pass this in as the order for that quantity property and that causes the Corapleth to show up in that order. Then I also have um, hover data in the previous case, I, I kind of had some default hover data. I didn't configure it any, any more closely than that. But um, one of the things you can say is give it a hover name property, which I'm just saying use the index value for that. Well, the index value is the state name. So you can see up at the top here, it's showing Washington. That's because I've told it to use a hover name that is the value of the state. So you see those different, different pieces. It also shows us the... Um, the quantity that's using being being used to determine the category, and then the the code, which is the the state ID. In addition to that, and it'll do that by default. It'll show you any of the values that you've used for for the determining the the coloration and the particular uh, the particular identifier that's used for location. But I also also wanted to include in this pop up the number of confirmed and fatal cases. So I've added a hover data keyword and named those two columns as additional pieces of information I wanted to include in the in the hover data. So we can hover over any state and see the details of what's taking place in that particular state at this moment. The Corapleth shortcut here in the Plotly Express library doesn't allow us to specify all of the details of the layout. So I also, uh, in this case, uh, once I get the figure back from the Corapleth method, I'm also calling a method on it that allows me to update some of its configuration that's not directly available inside the Corapleth function call. So in this case, I'm applying that same margin again to basically make the make the plot take up as much of the screen as it as it can. And then finally, evaluating the, the figure itself to, to yield the, the Corapleth.